20 Hayabusa build, 20 days of this so far. I can't believe it already. Okay, before I get started today, I wanna to show you something that was sent to me by a very kind and generous viewer. It's a gift and nothing more. And I just wanna show you it because I think it's absolutely fantastic. But before I can show you it and demonstrate it, I need a box of swarf and filings and mess. So let's make a mess and I'll show you what this is and how it works. Enjoy this. We made more of a mess than I intended there. <laughs> right, okay. Now that's made a right old mess. Let's show you what this is. Uh, this was from a very good friend of mine called Dan. He's a viewer for videos and watches what we do here. And he sent me this gift and this letter. And in short, this wonderful long letter here basically says that I see you using your lathe and your shop vac, my Karcher shop vac, to hoover up Swarf. Now, Swarf is a, a bane of your life. You make absolutely bin sacks full of it if you're lathe turning. All those ribbons of swarf and chips that come off everywhere all over the floor. Not only that, grinding and cutting with the discs and so on. This place is always full of swarf and metal dust. Now, what he's basically saying is when you use your karcher, you will ruin it eventually. And he's not wrong. A couple of times I've had big old karcher shop back going, getting all the swarf up, and this stuff just bunches up in the hose and you find yourself shoving broomsticks down it to try and clear the blockage and you can split the hose itself. You can just damage the machine and obviously it's inside the vacuum cleaner as well, bits of swarf and metal, need I say more. So rather than that, he said, look, you can use this. This will help you pick up the swarf in a simple, straightforward way and save your shop back. So thank you very much. Now, Dan, you know who you are, sir. Stand up and take a bow. I really, really appreciate this. I think it's absolutely fantastic, novel, unique, and I've never seen one before. Well, there's a lot of things I've never seen before, so it doesn't mean that after you haven't got one. They're available at various suppliers. So what I've done, I've put a link underneath this video in the description to this. But look, let's shut up talking and show you how it works. Quite simply, what it is, is a magnetic wand that picks up the swarf. But it's not just a simple magnet. Obviously, let's just take the packaging off. There's a little bit more to it. From looking at the construction, what it actually is, this part of it is a metal wand. Let's come over close show you it here, let's get it close, right here we are. This part of it is a metal tube and it's got a plunger there and what appears to be happening is there's, as you pull it out, connected to the end of this is a big magnet inside this metal tube. So when that's pushed in, that's magnetic, proper magnetic. Like that. <laughs> and everything sticks to the end of it. And then you can pull that out and as you pull it out, it demagnetizes this end. So everything that was stuck to it falls off. So you can push that in, pick up all your swarf, put it over a bin or a box, extract the rod at the back, and it all falls off. And what doesn't fall off, there's this little scraper on there as well to get rid of it. So I love that. That's really, really cool. It saves it going in your dermis, and obviously all over everywhere else and in your clothes. You can deposit your swarf in a safe place. Now, obviously, it's only going to work for ferrous metal, stuff that's going to be magnetic, but then it will also help to separate the magnetic swarf from the non-magnetic swarf. So two uses. Anyway, let's give it a test on that pile of mess and see if it works. Right. So magnet in place. Yeah, absolutely love that. It's like magnet on, magnet off. Excellent. A really useful bit of kit. I'm well chuffed with that. So Dan, thank you very much. That's a wonderful gift, my friend, and I will definitely use it. Clearly, it only works on ferrous metal. It's not going to work on this. Most of this is stainless steel and aluminium swarf. But that's not the point, is it? That's a wonderful gift for your general lathe turning, which is going to be on mild steel. Mine certainly is anyway. The only reason I kept that was because I don't want to put it in my household domestic waste bin, because that's not really fair on the dustman and the people at the recycling tip. That will go to the recycling in the metal bin when the time comes. But as for the iron filings, all that sort of thing on your bench, anything you're picking up, anything you're using. Certainly when I'm grinding with the grinder and the sander, as you saw the way it picked it up off the belt sander, fantastic. Excellent piece of kit, and I will put a link to this in the description under the video, so if you want one, you can buy yourself one. They're not expensive. There's a couple of links under there for various things as well as this. So there we are. Dan, thank you, sir. You're a gentleman. Really appreciate that. Right, let's go on with day 20. Let's jack the bike up, and I'll show you what I've got to get some of those bolts released at long last. Right, okay. Now, Rostov Blue Ice. Worth Rostov Blue Ice is its name, that's what I've got. And loads of you recommended Worth Rostov Ice. I will look into it 
and what it appears this product is is a cryogenic freezing fluid you spray it on it penetrates in and it freezes and therefore shrinks the actual fastener um, minus 45 degrees centigrade so it tells me now it says spray it on the fastener until it goes blue and then it will just break free the only thing that creeps into my head that would seem reasonably obvious is if you're freezing metal to the point where it actually shrinks and you're physically attacking it to make it shrink with a cryogenic fluid are you making it brittle is it just going to snap off purely because you've frozen it i don't know we shall see <laughs> won't we but yeah, i've got nothing else at the moment and this comes highly recommended from lots of you so i'm trusting what you say i'm going to give it a go it's going to spray it in there it's funny stuff it smells quite weird carefully because it's supposed to be minus 45 centigrade it's very cold indeed very cold and it smells like hospital bandages you know that sort of antiseptic smell sort of like the dentist a bit anyway whatever it smells like is irrelevant let's see if it actually works and gets those two fasteners out on this little bracket at the bottom i've got to get this bracket off today so i can remake it a little bit beefier a little bit lower and a little bit longer so i can hold the bottom of that whole assembly in place eyes down for a full house let's have a go Hmm. Right, one down, one to go. Some more in there. It's moved. Scary, scary, scary. <clears throat> That's stiff. It's not getting any lighter. Right. Lock the ratchet now. Just going backwards and forwards. I've got a quarter of a turn of nice free movement. But when I try and come out from it, it goes hard again, and that's when things snap. So in that area of free movement, lock the ratchet still, and then just going backwards and forwards to try and work the penetrant in to this sort of thread. It's so seized. So I've got the bracket away from the sump plate a little bit now, so I can actually get in the back of the thread. Right. Try and ratchet that out again. Oh yes, gotcha. Right, here we are, that was a drama, wasn't it? 25 minutes to get that one little screw out. But I think that's time well spent when you consider the consequences of snapping it off. Many, many, many hours of trying to get that stump out of what would be left and you probably would have made another solution and gone another way. But anyway, there we are, two clean threads to mount my nice bracket on that I'm gonna make today. I've got my bracket off. That's fantastic. That's that drama over. I'm going to chuck it on the bench, start measuring it up to make the next one.
there's your stop cut. Now, uh, just another little nugget for you, if you want, as I like to do with these things, slitting discs. If you're gonna use one mil thick discs for cutting steel, obviously you only use one mil thick discs for cutting steel. You don't use two or three mil, they're for grinding. But for cutting discs like this, there's a couple of do's and don'ts. The certain absolute, absolute don't is don't use them for grinding. Don't lean the side of them on something and try and grind it away because they're not designed for that. They're too thin and flexible and they'll just explode and hurt you a lot and you won't know it until it's over and there's blood on the floor so honestly always use these only for cutting their only strength is end on that's their only strength and they're great for cutting but even then cutting discs don't lean on them it's very important these little particular discs remember in these particular grinders they're spinning at silly speed and when you're pushing them through a piece of metal well actually you're not don't push them, let them go through on their own. What that means is, like the metalwork teacher said to you when you were 14 years old in school, with a hacksaw, let the blade do the cutting. So as the disc is cutting along the line, just let it go gently. It will work its way along the line without force. If you start leaning on it and forcing it to go through quicker, there's three or four things that can go wrong. First, you'll overheat the metal and you'll distort it if it's super thin stuff. Secondly, you can blow the disc up. Obviously, it's only got so much strength. And if you're really leaning on it, think of the speed it's spinning at. One little split in that disc, spinning at that speed, by the time you've realized that the disc has exploded, it's already in your forehead and bits of it all over the place. So spinning wheels, I think, are pretty lethal. They need the respect of a firearms handler. So if you're anybody who does firearms, if you go to the gun range and you go shooting, you'll know the respect that you give your guns, and these are the same. I believe that the venerable four inch, four and a half inch grinder is, is as lethal a tool as a firearm, and it needs the same respect. So there's a little note for you if you want to do this. Don't lean on these, no matter what you do. If you're cutting with a one mil disc, cut gently, and let the disc slide through at its own pace, and it'll be absolutely fine. And never grind with them on the side. I think it's obvious, isn't it? Oh, it's quite subtle. There's not just an L-shaped bracket. There's a bit more to it. There's actually a second subtle bend in it, just there. I guess to get it round the exhaust. And I've got that in there. Kind of a second bend, just there. So, best way really, just bolt it on the bike and see where it pokes out. Right, it's hitting the oil pipe, the hard oil pipe that comes out the engine. And much as I'm not gonna use that oil pipe because I'm changing these for the Goodridge ones and da da da, I do wanna make it so that if I choose to in the future, I can put the standard oil pipes back on. If down the line away, I find that that oil cooler's not working out or it starts to leak and I wanna put the standard one back on, I wanna be able to just bolt these pipes back on. I'll not have bracketry and all sorts of stuff in the way. So just to give myself belt and braces and future adaptable options, and all that, then I'm just gonna relieve that just a little bit so that it clears the pipe rather than just take the pipe off and then leave a big fat bracket in the way. It doesn't need to be that fat, it's three mil thick and deeper than the little thin tin one, which was perfectly adequate for the top. So let's just relieve a little bit of that out.
All right, there we go, that's it. Everything done. That's the radiators mounted, beefy mounts, three mil thick steel. None of these little pressed out bits of tin stuff. And adjustable, I've made the holes that everything bolts to seven mil for M6 fasteners. So you get that jiggleability that you can make everything fit and then nip it all up once it actually is screwed together. Everything's on mounts, ice elastic mounts. There's just one thing. There's big holes in this, in the top of the oil cooler there. Those holes are quite large. They'll take an ice elastic mount. So I've ordered a few more and I'll put a second mount in there. So the actual radiator itself, this oil cooler, it'll have a double ice elastic mount on the top. These two here and two actually in the radiator itself. So there'll be loads of movement in that just to absorb any of those vibrations from the engine so it doesn't crack things long term. But there we are, that is it. Now, at this point, I can do no more. Day job beckons, I'm afraid, I've got to go. It's three o'clock, I've been at this long enough. But that is it, at least I've done what I intended to do today. I've made a decent mount for that, nice and flush. I'll put dome heads under there eventually, so they're nice and flat, but I'm just using standard Allen heads because they're easy to mess about with. And also you can get a swivel head Allen key in there, so it's less fiddly to just pull them in and out, in and out, as I'm fitting things and fabricating. Things like this on these corners, I'll round those off later on. Everything will be made to look just that little bit more smooth and rounded once it's absolutely finished and I'll stop messing about with it. But I'm chuffed with that. A decent result and those bolts came out okay and I know those bolts come out. Now I was going to take them all out today, but I'll have to do it next time. I haven't got time. There we go. That is it. Hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Good old fashioned fabrication, my favourite pastime. Take it easy, ride safe and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.